Um, I'm Jerry Garfinkel. I'm the treasurer of the Jewish Study Center. And I'm also the one who sent the wrong, the incorrect Zoom link a little earlier today. Um, but I did try to make the correction, so many of you are still here. I think the uh, link that went out when you first registered was correct. When I sent earlier uh, around noontime today was incorrect. Um, so as treasurer, I want to tell you that our classes are free. We have uh, great instructors like Seth. And um, we do have expenses though, so we do appreciate donations. If you go to our website and uh, click on donate, you can fill out a form and uh, donate directly with your credit card or with PayPal. Or if you want to donate with check, it'll give you the uh, proper address to send your check. So you just go to our website, www.jewishstudycenter.org and all that information will be there. Um, so now a few technical uh, points. Um, first of all, I am now enabling the live transcript and closed caption. So if you have a problem hearing or maybe understanding uh, people like myself who may speak in a uh, some kind of New York accent, you may not understand. So you, you can look at the uh, uh, closed captions. Um, everyone is muted. And uh, if we do want your questions and your comments. So please write your questions and comments in the chat and address them to everyone. Uh, every once in a while, Seth will um, look at the uh, chat and he, he may uh, respond a, a bit to that. And um, he'll do a lot of response at the end of the program, but there'll be a few responses throughout the program. Um, and I'm probably forgetting something else, but and, oh, one, one more thing. Uh, our motto is come learn with us. And the way I'll interpret this right now is if you have any topic that you would like to teach or topic you'd like us to present in a class, please write to us at info at jewishstudycenter.org and we'll, we'll, we'll try to uh, uh, use your idea. Okay, and with that, I'll introduce um, Amy Schwartz. Amy, are you there? Amy Schwartz, um, who is our president and she'll do the introduction of today's program, I think, if I see her. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Now I see you. All You're right. There. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, we're happy to see you, or not coming out, I guess, as I, I should say. Um, we're happy to see everybody. I see some familiar names on the boxes, and um, especially happy to welcome you and welcome back again, the fabulous Seth Kibel. Um, Seth is one of the Mid-Atlantic's premier woodwind specialists. He works with some of the best bands in klezmer, jazz, swing, and many more forms. He has wowed audiences on clarinet, on saxophone, and on flute, and made a name for himself in this region, Washington, Baltimore, and well beyond. I think we have people from beyond. He is the featured performance performer with the Kleztet, the Bay Jazz Project, the Music Pilgrim Trio, the Natty Bow, and others. He has won 28 Whammies Washington Area Music Awards, including Best World Music Instrumentalist, it looks like every year from 2003 to 2011, and Best Jazz Instrumentalist in 2005, 2007, 2008, 2011, and through 2014. His latest recording is called When You're Smiling. It was revealed, released in 2018, on the Azalea City Recordings record label. His song, New Waltz, was the grand prize winner in 2016 of the Atlantic Song Contest. Um, when he's not performing, Seth lectures on a variety of topics in music history for numerous institutions, um, including Johns Hopkins and Towson. And um, if you end this program and you haven't had enough of him, you can go to his website. And the thing that leaps to my eye when I look at his website, sethcabell.com, is that tomorrow night you can go, you can sign up to hear um, a concert in Baltimore called 
clarinet flicks and chill, which I only wish we had thought of such a cute title for this program. But uh, on the other hand, this program is going to be so great. It, it needs no title. So take it away, Seth. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, Jerry and Bracha and Amy. It is great to be back here at the Jewish Study Center being beamed directly into all your various electronic devices. Okay, lots to do, lots to talk about, but those of you who have taken programs with me before know that I always like to get things started with just a little bit of music, just to kind of get my juices flowing and get you in the mood as well. So I'm gonna pick up my clarinet here and play a song for you. Um, what shall I play? Let's, well, since in a few minutes we're gonna be talking about the Brothers Gershwin, of course, George and Ira, I'm going to play uh, for you a song that is purported to be the final musical composition of George Gershwin before his untimely death. In fact, the lyrics to this song weren't written uh, by Ira until after George had passed, which gives them an added level of poignancy. This is Our Love is Here to Stay. Thank you so much for what I'm just vainly assuming is your virtual applause. Thanks again. Welcome to tonight's program. Uh, just to go over a few ground rules once again, because of the numbers involved, we're, uh, we're keeping everyone muted. Uh, Amy and Bracha will say that it pains them to do so. They're lying. They actually get derive great joy out of keeping all of you muted. 
Uh, but what we want to do is fully encourage everyone to avail themselves of Zoom's chat window, chat feature. In fact, I would recommend that you go to the bottom of your screen and hit that chat button right now so it's off to the side of your screen the entire time. And at any point during my presentation, while I'm talking, playing a recording, whatever, you can feel to type anything in that chat window, any comments, questions, comments, quandaries, conundrums, conniptions, go ahead, type them in. I may not see and respond to what you're writing in real time, but I promise at several points during the presentation, I will take a peek in said chat window and do my best to address everything even remotely pertinent contained there within. And then at the end of our program, uh, Amy uh, will, will let me know if I missed anything important in the chat window. Okay, having said that, this is a three-part series on the Jews of Tin Pan Alley. Tin Pan Alley being, of course, a name uh, in addition to a geographic location, a kind of catch-all term uh, for the golden era of American song in the early decades of the 20th century originating from the island nation of Manhattan. Um, as you probably already know, a presentation on Tin Pan Alley and a presentation on the Jews of Tin Pan Alley are going to be almost the same exact presentation. Indeed, as we'll see, Tin Pan Alley uh, was built by and featured and um, was a creative outlet for a veritable army of Jewish songwriters and composers. Uh, let's start with the actual location itself. Uh, Tin Pan Alley is, in the most literal sense, an actual geographic location, West 28th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenue, um, not far from where the Flatiron Building is today, if you're familiar with that in Manhattan. And yes, this is indeed where in the first half of the 20th century, all these great, or a lot of the great songwriting publishing companies were based. Every building in every block had songwriters and song publishers on every floor. Now, to understand the origins of Tin Pan Alley, we need to go back further. Um, one thing that shapes every aspect of American culture, really for the last 200 years, is the rise of the American middle class in the decades after the Civil War. And in the latter half of the 19th century, one of the hallmarks of middle-class life in this country, and this cut across race, ethnicity, geography, whatever, if you were middle-class or even aspired to middle-class life, one defining characteristic was this thing, the upright piano. Everyone had them. There was an explosion in pianos, and that makes sense if you think about it. We're talking about the late 19th century. We're talking about a time before radio, TV, phonograph, I don't even think they had smartphones back then. I think they were still using flip phones. The piano was one of the only way of entertaining oneself in the home. So everyone got these upright pianos. And along with that came the same piano lessons for every middle class child in America, ostensibly given by the same old woman. Um, as a result of this phenomenon, by the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, you have this unique moment in American history where almost every American is a lousy pianist. I'm being kind of glib, but that's not that far from the truth. Almost everyone could play piano. Now, most people weren't very good. They couldn't play Bach or Chopin or anything demanding like that but they had some ability to read music and play piano. As a result, there is suddenly a huge demand for fun, easy to play sheet music for amateurs. This is how Tin Pan Alley starts. Honestly, this is the moment where music becomes big business in the country. A lot of people think, oh, it's you know the record business in the early 20th century or radio or something like that. No. It's the sheet music industry. I mean, it really starts in uh, 1892. 
a songwriter, not a Jew, named Charles Castle Harris, publishes a little ditty uh, called After the Ball. It's, it's, a really, it's a little waltz tune. If you've ever heard it, I'm not going to play it now. The lyrics are all about an old man pining for the love of his life who he never asked to marry him because he was at a dance. And after the ball, he saw her with another man. So he figured she was spoken for. And only decades later, discovered that man was her brother. What a stupid story. Anyway, um, that song, After the Ball, sells over 5 million copies of sheet music. Five million copies. I mean, think about it. I don't, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I'm sure there weren't even close to five million pianos in the United States in the 1890s. So you figure that every piano had a copy of After the Ball on it. Probably several copies as copies disintegrate and get ripped up. This is when music becomes big business. Now, it ends up centering in New York, and it ends up, ends up centering in that block of Manhattan in 1897 when a Jewish songwriter named Leopold Feiss rents a room and a piano on that block of West, West 28th Street. And by within a few years, this block is where all the song publishers are based. Now, the name Tin Pan Alley came from an article in the New York Herald in 1902 written by a Jewish journalist uh, named Monroe Rosenfeld. Um, and Monroe Rosenfeld had been tasked to write a feature story for the New York Herald about all these song publishing companies that had sprung up in this one block of Manhattan. And Monroe Rosenfeld was interviewing uh, one of these songwriters, another Jewish songwriter named Aaron Gumbinsky, who changed his name to a much more noble sounding Harry Von Tilzer. I like that. Anyway, um, and Harry Von Tilzer uh, talked about the noise level in the street. And this is something I want you to think about, because I think it's, it's hard to imagine what this may have sounded like. You had an entire block where every building on every block had song publishers. Um, let me show you that photo again in idea. So the entire block looked like that. Every floor, every publisher, song publishers. Now, every publishing company might have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve different songwriters in their employ. And every songwriter would have a little makeshift cubicle. That cubicle would consist of a lousy upright piano, probably at a tune, and a little wooden table for them to, to write stuff on. And there would be temporary barriers between them. Every songwriter, every floor, every building in that block. And uh, Harry Von Tilzer talked about how when you would walk down the street in the middle of the day, it was this ungodly sonic chaos as you heard literally hundreds of songwriters plinking away at their pianos in various keys simultaneously with obviously... Nothing in the way of modern soundproofing or insulation. And he said in the article, it sounded like a whole bunch of kids banging on tin pans. Tin Pan Alley. That's how it gets its name. All right. I better get to some real specifics here because I've got so much to do over the next three weeks. If you're going to talk Tin Pan Alley, you obviously have to talk about the king of Tin Pan Alley. Someone who I've already mentioned, Mr. Jacob Gershowitz, better known of course, as George Gershwin. There are his dates, if you're keeping track, a date sort of person, September 26, 1898 to July 11th, 1937. His father, Moshe Gersh Gershowitz, was from St. Petersburg. And his mother, Rosa Bruskin, was from Lithuania, Vilnia, Vilnius. Uh, but they met in New York, and that's where they started their young family. Uh, they actually changed their family name uh, to Gershwin with a V, Gershwin, and then it would be George who would change the Gershwin to Gershwin, and once he did it, everyone else followed suit. Now, the Gershwins were actually quite poor, uh, to say the least. He did not have a middle-class upbringing. I mean, Moshe Gershwitz uh, uh, was, was not a well-to-do man. Nonetheless, they aspired 
to a middle class life for their family. So indeed, they scrimped and saved and got one of those upright pianos. Now they got it ostensibly for George's older brother, Ira. And when Ira is 10 years old, they sign him up for piano lessons. Uh, but it becomes pretty apparent that they, uh, they got the lessons for the wrong person. I mean, basically we're told that every lesson Ira would have, there would be, I have a wall here, I can't do it, but there would be little George, or Jacob, as he was still known, peering over the side of the piano, watching his older brother get this lesson. And at the end of the lesson, who went over to the piano, of course, Jacob, and played everything Ira was supposed to be learning note for note. So it became apparent really quickly that young Jacob, as he was still called, had a tremendous innate talent for music. Now, like any good middle-class parents, uh, they wanted to encourage this talent. And Moisha Gershvin actually kind of went above and beyond. I mean, look, this is a whole other topic. I don't want to get down this rabbit hole. But when I teach a lot of my jazz classes, a lot of people sometimes ask me, you know, how come so many of the great early jazz musicians were either black or Jewish? And that's a complicated question. I mean, obviously, a lot of black musicians gravitated towards jazz because it came from black culture. It was a black music. Also, remember that if you were a talented black musician, there were no other genres that were accessible to you and your talent. Now, with the Jewish musicians, it's a little more complicated. But I think one of the reasons is any time in history when you have a disenfranchised part of the population, a segment of the population that doesn't have the same social, economic, political access, the arts are often emphasized as a way to escape the cycle of poverty, if you will. And so when there were young musicians like Jacob Gershwin or uh, Benny Goodman in Chicago who displayed this talent at a young age, their parents leapt at the opportunity to cultivate this talent because they saw in that talent a possible avenue of escape from the cycle of poverty that characterized the immigrant experience. You know, in modern middle-class families, music is, of course, encouraged. You know, you get the kid instruments, you sign them up for lessons, you go to their concerts and say, good job. But when said middle-class child starts talking about music as a career, that's when respectable middle-class parents start to say, hey, wait a minute. Any resemblances to anyone sitting in front of you right now on Zoom is purely coincidental. So Moisha Gershwitz starts dragging young Jacob, soon to be George, around to some of the best piano teachers in Manhattan, including people like Charles Hambitzer and others, and basically begging for free piano lessons for his son. And most of the time, when these piano teachers hear what this little kid can do, they agree. So he gets very serious classical piano lessons. And by the way, I mean, one of the amazing things about George Gershwin, and, and you'll get some glimpses of this in a bit, was he had so many different skill sets. He wasn't just a talented songwriter. He wasn't just a talented composer. He was a virtuoso pianist who could play just about anything under the sun. By the time he's a teenager, he drops out of school. When he's 15 years old in 1913, young Jacob gets a job as a song plugger working in Tin Pan Alley for the princely sum of $15 a week. Now, what is a song plugger? A song plugger was a very important profession back in this time period. You know, in more modern eras, when a songwriter writes a song and a song publishing company has a song, you make a kind of cheap, quick recording of the song to, to play it for other people in the industry. We call this a demo record or demonstration record. That's been the practice from about the 1940s onward. Well, prior to that, of course, that's not practical. Uh, recording industry is still in its early infancy at this time, and you can't make a, a ch quick, cheap, and easy recording. So you have this entire profession of people called song pluggers or song demonstrators. 
Meaning this, a publishing company might have a bunch of songwriters, 12, you know, 10, five songwriters. Every day they're writing new songs. They get handed to the song plugger whose job it is to then go all around Manhattan and play these songs, piano and vocals, for other people in the music business. Play them for artists in the hopes that artists will incorporate them into their repertoire. Play them for show producers in the hopes they'll put them in the show. Later on, playing it for a record company and radio people in the hopes they'll market it. Playing it for music store owners in hopes they'll stock it and recommend that song to their clients. It's a very important job, and it's a very demanding job. And it's kind of like a graduate school in songwriting and composition for young 15-year-old Jacob Gershowitz. Because every day, he's handed a new stack of music in a myriad of styles, and he has to go perform these, piano and vocals and singing, well all over Manhattan. In fact, a few years later, when he hits the big time, a lot of people would say, hey, I remember that guy when he was a teenager and as a song demonstrator. Um, one person who uh, uh, comes, uh, young Jake comes to the attention of, is Mashevsky. The great star of the Yiddish theater uh, and grandfather to Michael Tilson Thomas, as you probably know. And Boris Tomaszewski recognizes the talent in this young Gershwin boy and arranges for him to apprentice with Sholom Secunda, the great composer of the Yiddish theater who co-wrote Romania, Romania and wrote by Mirbis Duchesne, among others. And supposedly, young Gershwin is fired by Sholom Secunda after about a month, for being supposedly, as he said at the time, too much American, too little Jew. And the story goes, uh, George Gershwin would make a point of going up to Sholom Secunda every time he encountered him on the streets of Manhattan going forward to thank him for saving him from a life of writing music for the Yiddish theater. Okay. He starts dabbling in composition. His first uh, uh, sold composition is a little novelty ragtime piece called Rialto Ripples. He sells that uh, in 1917 when he's all of 19 years old. Uh, but then in 1919, everything changes. Now look, let me put this in a bigger context. When we talk about famous musicians and composers and songwriters, some people have a gradual rise to fame and success. You know, each success and each hit builds on the previous one until they become, you know, the superstars we know and love. And then there are other people who have that one hit that catapults them almost instantly from zero to almost completely from unknown to the top of the charts. That's what happens with George Gershwin. And it's a little bit of a case of being in the right, of good timing. I mean, look, George Gershwin probably would have made it big because of his the strength of his talent anyway. But there is an element of being in the right place at the right time here. And let me explain. He starts writing songs with another uh, Jewish songwriter uh, by the name of Irving Caesar, a lyricist named Irving Caesar, uh, born with the name Isidore Kaiser. And they start writing some songs together. And one song they write together is a parody song. Parody songs were pretty common in Tin Pan Alley back then. Meaning, uh, whenever a song was a hit, all these people would write other songs that kind of capitalized on that hit by, you know, referencing it or, or, or being kind of a similar song or, or playing on the themes in that other song. Everyone wrote parody songs. Well, uh... George Gershwin and Irving Caesar decided to write a parody song of Old Folks at Home, uh, which is more commonly known as Swanee River. It's a Stephen Foster uh, classic. Um, Boris Tomaszewski. Tomaszewski. Did, it, did, the, did the closed captioning say Thomas Shevsky? Ross, it might have. The closed ca captioning does terrible things uh, to my lectures. I was doing a lecture the other day. This, this is true. And it was a jazz lecture. And I was doing a whole segment 
about the great early saxophonist Frankie Trumbauer. Frankie Trumbauer. And every single time I said Frankie Trumbauer, the closed captioning said Frankie Trump Tower. Every single time without fail. All right, anyway. Um, sorry, I got distracted by that. Okay, they write a parody song of old folks at home, better known as Swanee River. They call their parody Swanee. And of course, George Gershwin's famous quote is that when he and Irving wrote Swanee, the furthest south they had ever been was 14th Street. Um, well, Swanee uh, gets performed by an up-and-coming vaudeville star. Makes it part of his act. And this, this is a vaudeville star who's going places. He's already starting to make a name for himself by the name of Asa Jolson. Actually, he's known by his stage name of Al Jolson. Well, in 1919, Al Jolson gets something very new. What he gets is a record contract. Now, the record business in this country is basically less than a decade old. The first commercial records are around 1911 or so. Um, but for most of that decade, they're a luxury item. Not many people own phonographs and buy records. It's only the very well-connected and the very technically minded who do so in the early years. But 1919, 1920 is right when that starts to change. Right when they start mass producing Victrolas and the price of the phonograph goes way down and suddenly everyone starts buying them. And Al Jolson records this song, Swanee, in 1919, it's released January 1920, precisely at the moment everyone is starting to buy phonographs and records in large numbers for the very first time. As such, George Gershwin and Irving Caesar are fortunate enough to have the first real hit of the record business. It sells over 2 million copies. It's number one on the charts for nine weeks. It is a hit of absolutely massive proportions. It's the first real record hit of American history. Again, he's in the right place at the right time. This instantly catapults George Gershwin to the top of the heap of Tin Pan Alley almost overnight. Um, I mean, two million copies. I, again, I don't have the statistics in front of me. But I'm willing to bet there weren't two million phonographs yet. So imagine everyone had this record, and then everyone had the record broken by their little brother or sister, and then everyone got another copy. It was ubiquitous. Let me actually play you this recording now. Now look, you know this, not all songs stand the test of time that well. And Swanee, George Gershwin's uh, first hit, is one of those songs. There are definitely a few lyrics that are uh, a little uncomfortable to listen to. And believe me, this isn't even close to being the worst offender of its era. Uh, so, I mean, this is not a song that you'd want to necessarily, you know, perform live today. But I'm going to play you the original Al Jolson recording of Swanee anyhow, uh, just for historical interest. Um, this is audio only, everyone. Bear with me. Here we go. I've been away from you a long time. I never thought I'd miss you so. Somehow I feel your love was real Near you I long to be The birds are singing, it is long time The banjo strumming soft and low I know that you yearn for me too Swanee, you're calling me Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. I'd give the world to be among the folks in 
that I've seen pop up in the chat in no particular order. That was originally from a 78, of course, 78 record. Of course, it's been digitized now. I don't have a 78, you know, RPM phonograph with a USB cable hooking into my computer. Um, Now, I I should clarify, there's a question in the chat. When I say parody song, uh, the phenomenon of a parody song definitely did not necessarily mean making fun of the original song. You know, I think that's kind of a modern parody. A parody song meant it somehow referenced or was connected to another song. That's what they meant. When you talked about a parody song uh, back in this time period, it meant in some way this song was connected to another song that everyone knew. In this case, this song very clearly references and is based on... um, Stephen Foster's Old Folks at Home, better known as Swanee River. Um, Sheet music sales for Swanee. I don't have those stats in front of me, but it did sell very well as well. I mean, the record sales drove the sheet music sales and vice versa. Those are very synergistic. Ooh, that's a big word. Synergistic uh, phenomenon. All right, look, I could easily spend all three sessions of this course talking about George Gershwin and not even come close to running out of material. Uh, But I want to have time to move on to some other stuff. So I want to jump around a bit and do a few other things pertaining to George Gershwin. Let me specifically talk about some of the more Jewish elements or what's the Jewish influence in his music. And there's no question there is a Jewish influence, either conscious or unconscious, in much of the uh, music that George Gershwin wrote. Now, George Gershwin was not religious. He certainly never denied his Jewishness. He identified as Jewish culturally. Uh, There was a famous quote, and I forget who first said this. I apologize, I don't have my notes in front of me. But the quote was, you couldn't get George Gershwin into shul, but you couldn't get the shul out of George Gershwin. Uh, You know, look, um... Let me, let, me, let me bring up one thing that I'm always asked about when people talk about the Jewish influencer, Klezmer and George Gershwin, and it's this thing. You know, people talk about name that tune. I can name that tune in three notes. I can name that tune in five notes. Uh, that's one of the few songs, musical compositions, I know that people can often name in, in half a note. I mean, a lot of times I'm not even done going and people are going Rhapsody in Blue. It's one of the mo- most iconic opening notes in music history. It's right up there with... All right, l- l- let me do it for a second. Hold on. I better stand up to do this.
Okay. So people ask me about that opening schmear <laughs> and say, aha, that's George Gershwin writing Klezmer. Well, yes and no. Here's the true story. The true story is that that is not what George Gershwin actually wrote for the introduction of Rhapsody in Blue. What he wrote for the introduction of Rhapsody in Blue, well, he actually, he wrote a two piano score, uh, which then was uh, um, handed off to Faraday Graffe. Yes, that Faraday Graffe to orchestrate for the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. But what um, George Gershwin wrote in that two piano score and indicated it was supposed to be played by clarinet was a traditional classical glissando from the bottom of the clarinet to that high C. This is what George Gershwin wrote and intended for the introduction of Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> And it was the clarinetist with the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, which premiered Rhapsody in Blue in 1924, a little-known clarinetist, not Jewish, named Ross Gorman, who had listened to klezmer music and had learned some of the techniques. And he came up with the idea of changing that to a schmear. And supposedly, he went to George Gershwin during rehearsal and said, hey, Mr. Gershwin, what do you think of this? Played it for him. And George Gershwin said, I love it. Do it that way. But it's really ironic that that iconic opening, one of the most famous opening notes in music history, was not what George Gershwin originally intended. Now, that's not to say there isn't a Jewish influence in the music of George Gershwin. Of course there is. I mean, it's probably most pronounced in his uh, crowning... Uh, achievement, um, the, the 1935 folk opera, for lack of a better word, uh, Porgy and Bess. Now, lyrically, of course, Porgy and Bess is about, about black life on Catfish Row uh, down in Charleston, South Carolina. But musically, it was some of the most Jewish-sounding music uh, George Gershwin had ever written, whether it was the opening lullaby of Summertime, or most famously in a song from Porgy and Bess that lyrically is about the Old Testament. And I see someone's already mentioned it in the chat. It ain't necessarily so. Now, many people have noted and, po and postatized, posited, hypothesized. Uh, that George Gershwin either consciously or unconsciously wrote the melody, based the melody to it ain't necessarily so, over the blessings over the Torah. You know what I'm talking about. The bar mitzvah boy goes up to the Torah and goes, Baruch Adonai, Baruch Le'olam, Vayed, Baruch Adonai. similarity there. Whether it was conscious or unconscious, it's hard to say because uh, George Gershwin hadn't been in synagogue since he was a small child, but it's undeniably there. By the way, quick tip for you, it ain't necessarily so. Also provides you with a very easy way to remember how to pronounce my last name. You just repeat the following lyric to yourself. It ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to hear from Seth Kybel, they ain't necessarily so. All right, I want to close up our George Gershwin segment by showing you, well, I call it a rarity. Oh, don't worry, Amy, I've been called much worse. Um, and actually, to be honest, there's even different pronunciations within the family tree. Uh, my people, we say Kybel, but there are, there are kinfolk who pronounce it differently, so we'll... We'll let it go. Now, I can't, I mean, I can tell you the horrible truth about my name. I might as well tell you right now, because I'm, I'm putting it all out there. I'm bearing my soul to you. Now, Kybel is the Polish equivalent of barrel maker, Cooper. You know, my brother actually is named Gary, Gary Kybel. He's actually Gary Cooper. Um, but it gets worse than that. 
A few years ago, people started telling me something and I thought they were joking at first, but they're not. I have verified this is completely true. In Poland today, Kybel has become the slang, a slang term for a toilet. Like going to the John, you go to the barrel. Seriously, if you do like a Google image search for Kybel, it's going to be like me, toilet, 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 me, toilet, toilet, toilet. I mean, it explains why my career hasn't taken off in Poland. Okay. Um, I want to show you what I, what I, I instinctively call a rarity, but it's not a rarity now because of the wonders of the internet. Uh, now anyone can view this. Uh, but it is a rarity in the sense that for many years, not many people would be able to see this. And it's amazing that we have it at all. And that is actual film footage of George Gershwin at the piano. As you know, George Gershwin passed away in 1937 at a very young age, uh, very tragic. So we have very little actual extant film footage. What I'm gonna show you now is one of the few video clips we have of him, and it's absolutely wonderful. And it gives you a glimpse of his tremendous talent as a pianist. And it's, it's, it's magical to see. It's the closest we have to an actual time machine. Uh, let me just set this up for you before I show it to you. Um, uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. This is filmed on August 31st, 1931 at the Manhattan Theater in New York. And it features him at the piano playing kind of an improvised arrangement of his relatively new hit song, I Got Rhythm, which he wrote for Ethel Merman a year earlier for her Broadway debut in the musical Girl Crazy. The famous story is after the premiere of Girl Crazy, uh, George Gershwin went up to Ethel Merman and said to her, promise me you'll never listen. Um, anyway, he's playing his relatively new hit, I Got Rhythm, on piano. Now, what they've done here in this YouTube video is really quite wonderful. There are two different camera angles that were filmed simultaneously. And what they've done is rather than edit them together, you're gonna to see the same clip twice from a different camera angle. It's really quite wonderful. And like I said, we have so few actual film clips of George Gershwin that it's quite remarkable we have this. Let me get this queued up, my apologies. I wanna make sure I do this right. All right, here we go.
remarkable. Um, yeah, that, that's just an amazing clip to see. You know, just as an aside, uh, that for years there's been talk about a, a, another, um, a, a, like a really actually decent Ger George Gershwin biopic. There's an old Hollywood one that's completely fictional, but a real George Gershwin biopic. And it's one of those movies that's been caught in limbo, like production hell, as they call it, for like a decade or so. It was uh, the rights to George Gershwin's story have been optioned by Steven Spielberg. He was going to produce it and possibly direct it. They cast George Gershwin. They cast Zachary Quinto. I don't know if you know that actor. He's been in a bunch of things, but he, and he looks like Gershwin. He does. He was cast as George Gershwin, but they never scheduled filming. It's still in pre-production. It's been in pre-production for like a decade. I don't know what the current status of it is. Okay, look, I got to get moving. I get on all these tangents and I never get to half the stuff I want to do. I want to at least start today our discussion about George Gershwin's arch rival, arch nemesis in the world of Tin Pan Alley. This will obviously take us into next week as well. And that, of course, is Mr. Israel Isidore Baleen, better known as Irving Berlin. And there are his dates, if you're keeping track of dates sort of person, May 11th, 1888, September 22nd, 1989. You know what? Before I do anything else, I want to play a song for you because I always like to play music. So I want to, I want to do another song for you. I'm going to play an Irving Berlin song. And this is one of my favorite songs. Um, uh, by Irving. Yes. Yeah, Zachary Kinto played is the other Spock. Uh, he was cast as George Gershwin, but I don't know what the current status of that movie is. Um, anyway, um, this is one of my favorite, uh, Irving Berlin songs. Um, this is blue sky. Now, a couple of things about this song. Uh, Irving Berlin first wrote this song uh, after the birth of his daughter. Uh, he played it, he paid it almost, it, uh, wrote it supposedly almost immediately after she was born. I mean, I assume not immediately after she was born, but pretty close after she was born uh, in 1926, summing up how he felt at that time. And it's become one of his most perennial hits. I mean, it's been... It's, it becomes a number one hit in 1927 when it's sung by Al Jolson. Again, there's Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer, the very first motion picture with sound. Before motion pictures with sound, songs and movies tended not to become big hits. And of course, Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer plays a cantor's son. Al Jolson was a cantor's son. And so was Irving Berlin. Um, but, but Blue Sky has become a hit Again and again and again. It's been recorded by everyone under the sun. Uh, it was even a number one hit for Willie Nelson in 1978. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about with Irving Berlin more next week is unlike a lot of other songwriters, Irving Berlin wrote his own lyrics. He was a lyricist, too. And he was a brilliant lyricist. But he was a very different lyricist uh, than someone like Ira Gershwin. You know, Ira Gershwin was an absolutely brilliant wordsmith who could come up with the most clever and intelligent of lyrics with complex rhyme schemes and puns and jokes within jokes. And, and just, I mean, the things Ira could do with the word were absolutely brilliant. Irving Berlin is the complete opposite. A classic Irving Berlin lyric is idiotically simple. You know, no words more than three syllables. No complex or clever rhymes. There's nothing clever or different about an Irving Berlin lyric. But Irving Berlin lyrics are absolutely perfect. They're like Hallmark cards. Just all the right words, the right sentiments, and nothing more. It's complete opposite from someone like Ira Gershwin. And Blue Skies is just a great example of it. Now, look, I'm not going to sing it for you. You should be thanking me for that. But, but let me read you the lyrics to Blue Skies, and you'll see what I'm talking about. If you were to submit these lyrics, you know, for a songwriting project, you'd probably get an F. There's absolutely nothing creative about them. But dang, they're perfect. They're brilliant. All right, here they are. Blue Skies, smiling at me. Nothing but blue skies do I see. Bluebirds singing a song, nothing but bluebirds 
all day long. Never saw the sun shining so bright. Never saw things going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by. When you're in love, my how they fly. Blue skies, all of them gone. Nothing but blue skies from now on. I mean, like I said, there are no SAT words there. There's barely any rhymes. He rhymes skies with skies. Song and long, bright and right, by and fly. That's it. It is so basic, but it's so perfect. It sums down, it sums up the essence of the optimism in that song just so succinctly. All right, all right I got to play a song. Feel free to sing along since you're all muted. Well, you know, this might be a good place to start to wrap up. I'm going to go a little bit out of my intended order. Since we're talking about blue skies, let me show you the film clip where it became a big hit. And again, it brings us back to Al Jolson. I didn't plan this to be such an Al Jolson um, uh, centric uh, session. So uh, what happened, as I mentioned, he wrote it in 1926 after the birth of his first daughter. It was a last-minute addition to a Rodgers and Hart musical back then. You know, this was common in the early days of Broadway. You know, they would just piece together songs. They didn't have to do anything to do with the plot. And there was this Rodgers and Hart musical named Betsy, which was a complete flop. But it starred this starlet named Belle Baker, who threw a diva fit, as starlets are wont to do at the last minute and needed a new feature song. And Rodgers and Hart weren't available. So the producers got Irving Berlin, he contributed the song Blue Skies, 
The show was a flop, ran for 39 performances, but the song was a hit. She had to sing it every night twice in the show and as an encore. And then, of course, it's sung by Al Jolson and the jazz singer. Now, let me show you the clip from the jazz singer, and it's wonderful. So in this uh, segment, Al Jolson sings this song to his mama in the movie, to his Jewish mother. And uh, it's you'll see him pretending to play piano very badly. He's not actually playing piano. I mean, if you look at his fingers and listen to the piano, you'll realize pretty quickly it doesn't match up. But it's Al Jolson singing the song Blue Skies. And then, of course, he sings it jazz style. <gasps> and his father, the cantor, walks in on them while he's singing jazz. The horror. Can you imagine? All right, let me show you this clip, and then we'll start to bring the session to a conclusion. This is 1927, the jazz singer, Al Jolson, singing Irving Berlin's Blue Skies. Wait, let me make sure I did the chair properly. Okay, I did. Here we go. Come on. someday, too. You see if I don't. <laughs> Mama, darling, if I'm a success in this show, well, we're going to move from here. Oh, yes, we're going to move up in the Bronx. A lot of nice green grass up there and a whole lot of people you know. There's the Ginsburgs, the Guttenbergs, yeah. and the Goldbergs. Oh, a whole lot of birds. I don't know them all. And I'm going to buy you a nice black silk dress, Mama. I know it's not meant to be funny, but the line that always makes me laugh in this clip is when he says there's a lot of nice green grass up in the Bronx. Uh, you see, Mrs. Friedman, the butcher's wife, she'll be jealous of you. Oh, no. Yes, she will. You see if she isn't. And I'm going to get you a nice pink dress that'll go with your brown no, eyes. No, I, I what, what do you mean, no? Oh, no who, who is telling you? What do you mean, no? Yes, you'll wear pink or else. Or else you'll wear pink. <laughs> and, darling, oh, I'm going to take you to Coney Island. Yeah? Yes, I'm going to ride on the shoot to shoot. Oh. And, you know, in the dark mill? Yeah. Ever been in the dark mill? Oh, no, I well, with me, it's all right. I'll teach you and hug you and feel my <laughs> Now, Mama, Mama, stop now. You're getting kidnapped. Mama, listen, I'm going to sing this like I will if I go on the stage, you know, with this show. I'm going to sing it jazzy. Now, get this. Blue sky, smiling at me, 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 me. Nothing but little blue sky, do I see? Do, 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 do. Bluebird, singing a song. Oh, the horror discovering your son playing jazz. Whoops, let me get this out of there. Okay, so look, um, let, let me, uh, let, let me uh, do a couple of things before we kind of get to some final questions. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure before I forget to say all my thank yous. Thank you, of course, to the Jewish Study Center uh, for having me yet again. Uh, they've really done do great work, and it's great to be able to connect with so many people uh, all over the place this way. Thanks to Jerry and Bracha and uh, Amy and everyone else. Um, I also want to thank all of you guys. Look, I know Zoom fatigue is a real thing. 
uh, and, and we're all kind of tired of it to some extent, I really appreciate everyone logging in, spending the evening with me. I'll do my shameless plug. You know, people mentioned this earlier. I'm all over the place. I got a lot of albums out, and, and I tour and whatnot. Um, best play to find out about me is, is go to sethkeibel.com. Shockingly enough, that domain name wasn't taken, and that contains information on my recordings and my tour and whatnot. I do have, as uh, was mentioned earlier, a concert tomorrow night in Baltimore on the music, but you can, if you live in Baltimore, you can buy in-person tickets if you got a Vax card. Or you can buy the live stream tickets. They do a high quality live stream so you can watch it from anywhere. Uh, the information is right on my website, sethkeibel.com. You know, and I've got an unusual name, so I'm easy to track down. You type me in in YouTube, you find me. Bookface, InstaTweet, Amazon, all that stuff. My stuff is everywhere. All right. Anyway, um, having done that, let me scroll through here and see if I've missed any comments. I sure I have. Um, yes, Gershwin was an amazing piano player. Um, oh, George Gershwin Junior High School in East New York. I did not know that. I'm not surprised there's a middle school named after him as well. There should be, uh, but that's nice to know. Um, scrolling through. Yeah, Sharon, I shouldn't joke about the Bronx. There are still... Uh, very nice areas of the Bronx. Of course, like I have some kinfolk up there and they, they call it Riverdale. And if you say, oh, you live in the Bronx, they'll say, no, we live in Riverdale. I'm like, isn't Riverdale in the Bronx? I mail you a letter. It goes to the Bronx. No, it's Riverdale. I don't know. Okay. I like to tell people, uh, I'm the product of a mixed marriage from New York. Uh, meaning my mom was from a Jewish family from Brooklyn. And my dad was from a Jewish family from the Bronx. Um, I grew up in the Burbs, of course, a little shtetl called Yorktown Heights. I once made that joke, and a woman came up to me very seriously afterwards and said, that means they must have loved each other very much. Okay, David says, talk about Berlin's piano. All right, I was going to get to that more next week, but I will give you the short story on that right now. Irving Berlin, in many ways, was the opposite of George Gershwin. One of the ways is the opposite is that Irving Berlin was not a very good musician. He was completely musically illiterate, could not read or write music. Other people had to transcribe his music for him, and he could barely play piano. In fact, he basically taught himself to plink out melodies only playing on the black keys of the piano. Um, and yes, later on in his career, he had these special pianos built for him. There's like three or four in existence. I know the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia has one. And these were pianos that had like a big lever. And you go, shunk! And it would shift all the keys over, left to right, and that would allow him to play in all different keys while only playing on the black keys of the piano. I'll talk about that more next time. Um, and also Berlin's Ill musical illiteracy, because it's a little bit controversial, because, I mean, no one doubts that Irving Berlin wrote his lyrics. But there is some question over how much of his music he actually wrote, because he couldn't actually write it down. Someone else had to do it for him. And supposedly, once he became a success, he had all these anonymous assistants, whose job it was to transcribe his compositions. And some of these assistants say that sometimes they came up with the melodies and they would play it for him and he would say, I like that, or change this bit, or alter it a little bit, but that some of the musical ideas weren't entirely his. Anyway, we'll get into that more next time. We're going to talk about Irving Berlin. I want to get into Hayum Arluk, Harold Arlen. I want to talk about Jerome Kern. I want to talk about Anne Rosenblatt, better known as Anne Rennell. Maybe Dorothy Fields. we got to give the ladies some attention as well. There are some wonderful female songwriters in the Great American Songbook. Um, I'm certain we're going to run out of time in all of these sessions. Uh, but I better wrap up right now. Amy, Bracha, Jerry, is there anything I've missed or anything else you want to say? Just thank you. I don't think you, you've missed you so much, Seth. 
But I will tell you, Seth, that I grew up partly in the West Bronx, which now is in the South Bronx. It moved. Like my father was born in Buchach in Galicia, but now it's in Ukraine. So places move. Well, I will tell you, Jerry, um, you know, my grandfather on my father's side was an obstetrician in the Bronx and apparently delivered a lot of Jewish babies from about probably about 1910 through about 1950 or so, maybe even a little after, into the 60s. So it is quite possible that you were delivered by my grandfather. Who knows? Now, I don't know what an obstetrician did back then other than say, push, and yes, it's a baby. But apparently he delivered a lot of the Jewish babies in the Bronx. Yeah, but I was not born in the Bronx. I was born in... Oh, okay, never mind. I grew up a little bit in the Bronx as well as the Catskills, mostly Catskills, but the Bronx. But I, I can't take hat. credit for you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> too much personal stuff. Um, I, I will uh, uh, basically have to uh, edit the, uh, uh, the recording a little bit because we, we had a little bit before the program began. But I'll try to put it out as soon as I can and send you an email. On the email, I'll try to put in some of, some of uh, Seth's uh, up, upcoming uh, performances. Um, and also tomorrow we have a different... A slightly different kind of class, uh, the third session on the Mishnah Berachot. So a little different from, from, from uh, Seth. Okay, uh, I hope to see all of you next week, maybe some of you tomorrow. And thank you again, uh, Seth. Thank you, Amy. And thank you a lot, uh, Brucha, for the last minute coming in and being the tech shoma. Uh, Bob, do you want to say something? You can unmute if you want. No, I was just saying goodbye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you all next week.